So he sort of industrialized the whole EVM chain uh, ecosystem, and we can onboard EVM chains actually quite fast now. We have three to 400 million addresses labeled. For every one of those labels, we have evidence and documentation. And of course, a lot of that documentation is uh, algorithmically generated. It can get out of hand really quickly and you can get like a negative spiral if you start getting the wrong labels. You know, living up to our name, we started using more AI for the labeling. The challenge there is like you might end up with probabilistic labels. And like I was saying before, you, you want to make sure that the precision is as high as it can possibly be. The machine is going to be doing like 99.95% of the work in terms of the, just the quantity of addresses. But the 0.05% that the human does can be very valuable and it can also be used by the machine to label all the stuff. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Alex Vanwick, who is the co-founder and CEO of Nansen, which is um, a blockchain analytics company. We'll discuss them um, in a lot of detail in just a bit. Um, before we do that, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a visionary collective committed to fostering and expanding applications for a decentralized future. Gnosis is at the forefront of innovation with Gnosis Pay, Circles, and Metri, revolutionizing open banking and creating a superior form of money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they are building a more resilient and privacy-focused open internet. Are you seeking a robust L1 to launch your project? Well, look no further than Gnosis Chain. Enjoy the same development environment as Ethereum, but with significantly lower transaction fees. And with a robust network of over 200,000 validators, Gnosis Chain stands as a credibly neutral and resilient foundation for your application. Governance at Gnosis is driven by Gnosis DAO, where everyone has a voice in shaping the project's future. Join the Gnosis community today by participating in the Gnosis DAO governance forum. You can deploy your project on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis Chain, or help secure the network by running a validator with just a single GNO and low cost hardware. Embark on your journey towards decentralization today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. It's a pleasure to have you on, Alex. Before we get uh, started with Nans and properly, tell, tell us about yourself. What's your background and how, how did you end up where you are now? <laughs> yeah, no, great to be here. So, um, Depends how far back we want to go. I guess uh, my background initially is in AI. Uh, that's my my degree uh, from university uh, in Edinburgh, UK. Uh, so I was in AI before AI was cool, is what I like to say. <laughs> so I spent a few years working with data science and machine learning, uh, also a few years in management consulting. And in 2017, I discovered Ethereum during lunch uh, at work. Uh, some engineers were very excited about it at the company where I was working. And then I fell down the rabbit hole very quickly because I think several people started talking about Ethereum at the same time. And so it sort of piqued my interest. Um, this was uh, the summer of 2017. And so a few months later, I decided to leave my job as a data science manager at the time. And I moved to Hong Kong to join a startup in the crypto space. So that was how I basically got into crypto. Uh, sort of, I would say I, I was not definitely not one of the earliest in crypto. Uh, I felt I was very late at the time joining crypto. Now I feel like I'm kind of a veteran almost, <laughs> which uh, 
which I guess uh, speaks to how young the industry is. But basically, after working a few years in crypto, both with a startup that unfortunately ran out of money pretty quickly, I spent some time with the decentralized exchange protocol Zero X, uh, helping them with, with analytics and understanding slippage across DEXs and things like that in 2019. Worked a little bit with Aragon as well, the DAO platform. And um, as mostly as a consultant, helping them out with data and analytics. And then I co-founded Nonsen, our company, um, late 2019. Or at least that's when we started working on it. And we went to market April 2020, about one month after COVID started, when everyone was gambling on governance tokens and, and yield farming um during COVID, so th that's kind of how i ended up where i am now so with your background it kind of makes sense that you would found um a blockchain analytics company um you also i mean you also have a background in a in ai and i assume general uh it stuff so was it was it kind of the the fact that you felt like you had already done this before or did you kind of, was there a larger mission to kind of ordering this mess that kind of actually is kind of like, if you run an archive node, you'll, you'll learn nothing unless you kind of do proper analytics on it, right? So what was, what was, what was uh, the main motivation to kind of go into this, you know, full time? It, I think it's a good question. I think there were a few different things happening at once. I, I will maybe say that firstly from like a career perspective, I thought of it as like a, a Venn diagram of two competencies, one being data and the other one being blockchain. I figured that if you are very good at both of those, you probably end up in an intersection that's pretty small. So from a career perspective, I figured that it's a good idea to learn about these two things because not that many people in the world are going to know about those two things. That was probably from a career perspective. And then I also like very rapidly became like sort of enamored with um, the crypto industry, because when I was interacting with people on Twitter and Telegram and things like that, I found that people were very open-minded and they were very inviting in a way that was almost a bit surprising to me. I kind of thought of crypto as being a little bit kind of, you know, almost like antagonistic or adversarial <laughs> because it's very technical and all that. But I, I found that people were very open-minded and sort of intellectually quite interesting. So I think that also appealed to me from like, almost like a culture perspective. And then there was another thing that was, I think, more specific to data, maybe even more specific to, to Europe, you know, which is uh, where I was based at the, at the time, which is a, a GDPR, like privacy regulations were kicking into full force. And um, I think I kind of became a bit frustrated as a data scientist working with data. And there were so many regulations you had to navigate that it became really hard to do your job frankly like it was because everything you had to you know check all the boxes and all this stuff and so i was i kind of wanted to work with data that was not like customer or user data i wanted to just work with data sets where you don't need to like fill out a form to be able to use them and so blockchains were interesting because so much so much of it is from public blockchains right the information is just there and the data is there and so you don't need to ask permission for someone to dive into like all this exciting activity that's happening on chain. So, so, you know, those were some of my personal reasons. And then I think, uh, if I look at it from like the market opportunity side, you know, you didn't have great analytics tools or products at that time. I think there was really only one game in town for on-chain analytics, uh, which was chain analysis. I mean, you, you had other products like at a, and, and I don't want to belittle them, but like most people knew about chain analysis for um, AML uh, purposes. But I felt that, you know, people who are just um, in crypto, who are trading, who are investing, who are using blockchains, they're not necessarily law enforcement or tax authorities. They should have great analytics products too. And so I felt like there was an opportunity there to just provide them with a better product so that they could understand what's happening on chain and they could make better decisions investing. They could, you know, make better decisions building products and protocols and building blockchains or L2s now these days, right? So, so yeah, there's kind of, there were many different factors that sort of led me, led me here. 
I can chime in here and say that as a blockchain founder myself, I have used your tool um, a lot, particularly for one use case for which um, it just beats all the alternatives out there. And that is kind of, um, you're very good at labeling wallets um, and kind of saying who you think uh, they belong to, what kind of person or kind of uh, it is. And uh, I, I'm super interested in um, how decentralized our token holdership is, right? So kind of I would go to, I would go to kind of like the Gnosis token and kind of just list it by kind of like uh, by, by uh, how, which address holds how many. And I mean, in the beginning, um, I knew who a lot of the people at the top of the list were, right? I mean, kind of that's to kind of how, how projects start out, but kind of um, kind of how 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 far can I go down the list until I find the first person who I honestly don't know who that is? To me, that's been that's always been very comforting to know that kind of like there's lots of people out there who are involved in the pro uh, project in some way, and I have absolutely no idea who they are. And I mean, that's I mean, that's only increased over the years. So, um, yeah, but I, I yeah, so this is this this is how I this is how I first learned about um, Nansen, I think when it came out in 2020 or so. Yeah, you you bring up that that's like a very common use case, right? Especially among builders uh, who want to just understand their investor base or like who's holding the token. And and I think you're right that this is also one of the opportunities that we saw that, you know, in a way, it wasn't that interesting to just get the blockchain data because, in theory, anyone could could do that. The hard part is to figure out like what's the entity that's associated with the address, and we saw an opportunity there to to sort of help people get more transparency on that front, and uh, and you know that is one of the core things that we do very well, right? And and we have at this point like three three, maybe even 400 million addresses labeled at this point. I can speak to that as well, because this is also one of the use cases I use Nansen for. I check whether I have doxed myself. So obviously, kind of, I have assets <laughs> on, on different addresses, and I try not to, to, I try to kind of keep them apart. So kind of, if, if, if you guys don't, if they're not labeled on Nansen, I think I'm probably okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that is, uh, that, that is true. I mean, maybe, it, you know, we should, we should also just call out that you know, if individuals have their name labeled in Nelson, they can contact us and we will, and if you want to remove it, we will remove it. There are, uh, there's a bit of nuance to that because uh, sometimes people inadvertently dox themselves on chain. So they might like buy a .eth name or something like, like a, an ENS. Uh, and we can't do anything about that because that's immutable and like etched into the, the history of the blockchain. But yeah, so so you know there there's uh, that this is like a kind of a blessing and a curse of blockchains that they are transparent, they're immutable, et cetera. So um, what, something that I've always wanted to ask you is Nansen actually named after fridge of Nansen um, of yes, passport fame. Okay, yes. fantastic. Yeah, how, how, that's right. M maybe maybe tell us about Nansen and kind of why you why you settled on that name. Yeah, I mean, um, I you know I I think a lot about culture in the context of a company or a project. And I felt that Nansen is kind of an embodiment of the values we have in our company. And so values like courage, um, curiosity, you know, Nansen, for those who are not aware, is most famous for um, actually having been a polar explorer. He crossed Greenland on skis as the first person he went as far north on the globe as anyone had ever done. And the same ship that he used, uh, another polar explorer reached the South Pole first of any human being. Um, but he was also a scientist. And inter interestingly, it sounds like you know him for his work on um, creating passports for refugees. Yes, uh, yes. Which, which he did for you know almost half a million people. For stateless people, right? Yes, for stateless refugees, uh, I think mostly uh, around Armenia. So he was he was a uh, you know kind of a Renaissance person, um, an explorer, a scientist, a humanitarian. Even had played a big role in the creation of modern Kingdom of Norway. He convinced the Prince of Denmark to become the King of Norway, uh, so that they could become independent for Sweden. 
in uh, 1905. But, um, but yeah, so he's an embodiment of a lot of the values that we uh, live by at Nansen. Uh, curiosity, courage, transparency, speed, which is important when you're doing an expedition. You want to make sure you get there in time before you starve or run <laughs> out of, uh, you know, uh, what you need. Um, so, so yeah, so he's kind of an, an icon. And I think, like, it's, I, I also kind of like the idea that, um, a bit similar to Tesla, right, where, like, there's a, you've named the company after someone who's not the founder, but it's, like, an inspiring person. And, uh, and then it's two syllables. It's easy to pronounce in any language, which is nice. So yeah, that's those are some of the reasons why we why we named the company Nansen. And was the the URL Nansen.ai from the get go? Yes, it was. And uh, but I will say that the .ai was aspirational in the beginning, in the sense that you know my so I, I said that in the beginning. My my degree is in AI, and I always knew that we would be making use of AI for what we do. Things like labeling addresses. Now we use AI for, you know, estimating the price of an NFT that's fully machine learning powered and is part of our product, uh, which is actually kind of non-trivial, right? If you have a specific NFT, how much is this one valued based on its traits and transaction history, et cetera? We use AI to, you know, weed out spam tokens, which there's a lot of, uh, especially on chains that have lower gas fees and things like that. Um, we use AI for personalizing signals in the product. So I think, you know, Nelson, you know, we, we did have some foresight in that we knew that AI was going to become, you know, a big part of the world. It happened, admittedly, a bit sort of faster or more suddenly than I personally expected. But we're leaning into AI even more now than, than we were originally. Um, and so it's not like there's one AI angle with Nansen. It's more like it sort of powers the whole product in many different ways. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's always been, the, been, the, been the, the ambition to make sure that we are an AI trailblazer and we're making use of AI in great ways in the product and in the organization. Cool. Um, let's maybe dive into um, the the core of your product. So kind of like you started out with, and that's still very much your core offering, is kind of um, analytics for on-chain data. Um, most people who don't work on actual blocks themselves, um, they don't appreciate how much engineering effort actually goes into kind of creating um, like a state and a database and so on. Can can you maybe talk us through that kind of what 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 kind of say say I have an Ethereum archive node it's um, a terabyte or whatever kind of the the current size depends on kind of what what you're running but um, and how how do I get from there to kind of something that I can actually query? Yeah, so the way we do it mostly is uh, we make use of. Um, you know, RPC JSON endpoints from the nodes, and then we pull out specific data from from the nodes. And so uh, you pull out the blocks, and they have transactions, and you, uh, you if you want to go one level deeper, you parse out the events from smart contract uh, interactions. Like if you have the ABI uh, of a smart contract, then you would use that to be able to parse out the data that's uh, that's included in, in the transactions. So so that's kind of the I mean that, that's sort of like at a very high level, you know how you do it. And you know we we actually started out with a pretty different tech stack and architecture, and we've changed that recently. So we we used to use uh, so one of my co-founders is the creator of an open source project called Ethereum ETL, which um, which basically does this in an open source manner for Ethereum. And so you can actually like index uh, all this data. You know, if you have an endpoint uh, or you run your own node and you have that endpoint, you can index all this into like CSV files or into, you know, a database. And so, um, so he, he built that and that was kind of, that was one of the building blocks that we used to get started. Uh, over the years though, we have, basically uh, moved over to a, a different paradigm of loading the data, 
Uh, initially, it was you know Ethereum ETL, so Extract, Transform, Load, which many data engineers and so on will be familiar with. Now we do basically ELT, Extract, Load, Transform. So one of the reasons we do it this way now is because we integrate with lots of different chains, and different chains might have slightly different schemas. So the idea is if you first can just extract the data from the um, the uh, JSON RPC uh, uh, endpoint, uh, and you can just load the raw data in, then you can transform it later. So it's sort of, you delay the transformation and the schema harmonization of all the data and to, to a later point. And then we've also changed the, the database that we use. Um, we used to be based on BigQuery, um, which is a Google Cloud um, sort of proprietary analytical data warehouse technology. Now we use something called ClickHouse, which is uh, also an, an analytical database, but it's more performant for the type of use that we have. So in the past, we might have a dashboard that, I don't know when you were most using Nonsense, but Nonsense version one was actually pretty slow. And it some of the dashboards would load in like 30 seconds, which is kind of hilarious if we look back at it now. But with, with ClickHouse, you know, the same dashboard might load in like, you know, 300 milliseconds or something like that. So so we, we may, we've actually kind of evolved our tech stack and replace the whole thing, both the data pipelines, the sort of extraction of the data, and also how we store the data and how we could query it, et cetera. So which chains do you currently support? Uh, so we ha we actually have kind of a suite of different products. So for example, if you look at Nonsense Portfolio, which is our portfolio tracker, we support more than 50 chains. And so it, it's kind of all of the usual suspects, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, even Solana, and then a long tail of EVM chains. Um, and uh, for Nonsense Query, which is kind of the enterprise product where you can write SQL queries and people make dashboards, we support about, I think it's 20 plus chains, so a little bit fewer, but still more than 20. And then in Nonsense 2, which is the product that actually most people know, which is kind of the, the product that you've used and where you see your your holders for the token, token god mode, profiler, we support, um, I think it's now just over 12 chains, but we're adding a lot of chains every quarter actually to it. Um, and so, yeah, so, so it sort of depends a bit on which which products you're actually using. But uh, the, the ambition is to be adding like roughly one chain per month or more going forward because you do have, like the the world is very multi-chain uh, at the moment. And so you want to make sure that you're supporting all the chains that people care about and that they use. Uh, and, you know, we've sort of invested a lot in our tech in our tech to make it both faster and and frankly cheaper for us to integrate new chains. So we sort of industrialized the whole EVM chain uh, ecosystem, and we can onboard EVM chains actually quite fast now. Um, yeah, so 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 that's kind of how we how we look at it. Interestingly, there are a lot of non EVM chains that want to integrate with us, which on the one hand is great because you you want to support them, but on the other hand, it's also quite technically challenging because you have to sort of build a bespoke solution for every chain almost. But uh, but yeah, EVM, the EVM chain use case we've sort of industrialized in house. I am sure you kind of you have protocols for that. But how do you ensure kind of data accuracy and the reliability of the analysis? Mm, yeah, you can you can sort of talk about data accuracy or data quality in a few different ways in our product. So the most basic data accuracy. Uh, is about the on-chain data itself, right? So you want to make sure that you're not missing data, that, you know, you have tests where you see, you know, the number of transactions, is it in line with today with what you saw yesterday and that kind of stuff. So you can have basic sort of almost like unit tests, uh, data quality checks on that. I think the harder part, though, is on the attribution, the labeling of addresses, right? That And that's where there's potentially room for error. And so, you know, our philosophy is that we would rather not have a label than to have a wrong label. And so that means we have very strict requirements on precision. And so as an example, we for, you know, I mentioned we have three to 400 million addresses labeled for every one of those labels, we have evidence and documentation. 
And of course, a lot of that documentation is uh, algorithmically generated. But you can always look up, you know, if this address has this label, why does it have the label? So there's, you, you always have the documentation for it. And I think this is something that we, we take pride in, that we, we actually take that stuff really seriously. Because it can get out of hand really quickly and you can get like a negative spiral if you start getting the wrong labels. Because typically what happens is if you're looking at a new address and you want to label it, you start looking at what are the labels of the addresses, the, the neighbors of that address. And so if you have a wrong label, it can propagate very quickly and it goes out of control. And of course, you know, you get more wrong labels. That's the first thing. But secondly, more importantly, it can impact the user experience if people see a wrong label and they lose trust in your product. So this is something we take very seriously. And, and, and we, of course, you will always, you will always have some errors. Like that's, it's just not possible to have literally 100% precision. But it's actually very rare that we have incorrect labels. And even if you do arguably have incorrect labels, very often there's a very logical explanation for it. So at some point, I remember we were called out for having label and address Do Quan. And, you know, we were told that that was incorrect, but it turned out that it was basically Terra Labs or, you know, the company related to it. So, so you know, is that an error? Like maybe it is in a strict sense, but of course, you know, it, it's a very related entity. Um, and you might have a similar thing with like some uh, Suzu or, or Three Arrows and, and things like that. But, um, you know, we take pride in having the best precision on the labeling that we do. And this is something that's very important to us. Which specific heuristics do you actually use to kind of generate the labels? I mean, and how do you come up with them? I'm sure you kind of add stuff all the time, right? Yeah, so um, it's a combination of man and machine, right? So uh, the heuristics would be, some of them are deterministic and quite simple, right? So think of you want to label every Uniswap pool, then you can literally just look at the Uniswap factory. And like we were talking about earlier, you can, you know, look at the events that are emitted and the events contain all the information that deterministically say, here are all the Uniswap pools. This is like the easy case. And in theory, anyone who can like read blockchain data and have a system for this could, could do this. Then there are other things that are more complex, like exchanges, centralized exchanges, because they're technically the information is not deterministic from just the on-chain data. You need to do some inference and you need to understand like how these entities manage uh, private keys and manage addresses. And so there you typically have kind of a baseline um, heuristic that is sort of somewhat universal for any exchange. So you might say actually, if you send funds to an address and the address automatically forwards it to what we call a main wallet, like a Binance main wallet, then you can be pretty sure that that wallet is a deposit wallet for the exchange, right? And so this is going to be, you know, correct in most cases, but you may have to tweak it and you need to curate the main wallets because those can update, right? Uh, let's say HTX or, you know, Gate.io might get a new main wallet. You need to make sure that you're on top of that. And you need to have sort of alerting in in-house if you see lots of funds move because maybe they move to a new like cold wallet or a new hot wallet and so on and so forth. So um, and and so you you can state these heuristics programmatically, and you can label up a lot of addresses in this way. So it's kind of like a, an inventory uh, of many different heuristics, and sometimes the heuristics can build off of each other, but you know, living up to our name, we have started um, using more AI for the labeling recently. But um, the challenge there is like, you might end up with probabilistic labels. And like I was saying before, you, you want to make sure that the precision is as high as it can possibly be. And so I kind of, but yeah, it comes back to the same point where you have this man and machine setup where the machine is going to be doing like 99.95% of the work in terms of the, just the quantity of addresses. But the 0.05% that the human does can be very valuable and it can also be used by the machine to label all the stuff. And so 
Yeah, so it's interesting, right? Because the the AI approaches we've started making use of now, they kind of like almost sit in between the sort of the man and machine, like the human and the machine. Um, but we've we've seen, and and you can also, by the way, you can look at. I mean, depends like how far down the rabbit hole you want to go, but you can also look at the economics of it. Like, how much does it cost us to label an address? Right, like if you if you just think of the human labor or even like the cloud cost of the heuristics, and then you start looking at like optimizing that and saying actually you know the heuristic is very cheap, so you want to make sure that the heuristics can label as much as they can, and you want to be very selective of what you use human labor power for because that can be like ten dollars per label maybe depending on you know many different factors. So. So yeah, we're, we're, this is kind of an interesting optimization problem over time that you you have to like balance out different things. You want to make sure precision is very high. You want to make sure that also the the recall or the coverage is very high. You want to label as many addresses as, as you can. You also want to make sure that you can do it in a timely manner so that you can label addresses very fast. And you want to make sure that the economics are permissible so you don't break the bank. If it costs us like, 20 million dollars to label 20 million addresses like yeah that's probably not going to work right so yeah so so there are many interesting um factors here and like this in a way this is kind of the most unique thing we do at the company right if you think about it um and it's it's exciting because it's one of the areas that probably can be you know enhanced the most with ai in my opinion yeah absolutely um how fast do you um, label these addresses and big movements? I'm asking because obviously this um, kind of, if you're a trader, this can actually give you a lot of alpha, right? So, so if totally. someone kind of moves funds from a cold, from a known cold wallet to a hot wallet, um, chances are they're going to sell them, um, possibly on on an exchange. So you you might kind of want to front run them in the traditional sense. Um, not in the blockchain sense. So, um, how um, how fast do you do this, and um, do people explicitly use it um, for this sort of use case? Yeah. So we have a feature called Hot Contracts, and what Hot Contracts does is it looks at newly deployed smart contracts that have a lot of funds co going into them. And Hot Contracts uh, now, actually, very soon, like probably in a matter of mm, weeks is going to be enhanced with AI labeling. And so that means the idea is like, probably, I don't know if it will be minutes, because you kind of need to accumulate a bit of data on the address in terms of transactional patterns and stuff like that. But um, yeah, maybe minutes, um, at most hours, you know, you'd let loose the army of AI labelers on these hot contracts. And because we will have tuned and, and quality assured the precision, um, you'll be able to get pretty descriptive labels of what these contracts actually are, right? The, the, it's interesting, right? Because in a way, like some of our users who are very sort of power users and advanced users, they sort of see the alpha in us not having labeled an address because they know that that's like a new address. And because it's not labeled yet, if they figure out what this address is, they might be sort of one step ahead of the game. And so if you look at hot, the hot contracts table, ironically, a lot of the addresses are not labeled. But I think that's going to change literally like in a matter of weeks when we roll this out. And so I think some of the people who are using that feature, hot contracts, um, are, are probably going to see like almost like a night and day, uh, you know, change in that view. Uh, for other types of addresses, it depends, right? A fund, typically, it takes a while to actually figure out what the fund is. So if they move, like a VC fund or like a liquid venture fund or something, if they move funds from one address to another, that's maybe a, one of the more clear cut cases. But if you have a totally new address that is like providing funds in a seed round or something like that, it can be quite tricky you need to have multiple data points to figure it out and so those cases you can't talk about like minutes or hours that's like you know days or weeks or maybe months um so it really depends on like what kind of uh what kind of address or what kind of entity we're talking about 
so for the for the newly deployed deployed smart contracts, um, <clears throat> do you also do you also speculate about kind of what it's going to do? I mean, did, is it kind of uh, it, does it is there a label that says we think this is going this is this is a newly l l launched pap exchange or something? Yeah. So okay. so the so the idea the idea is like um with labels, right? There are a few different ways to think about labels. One is just give it a name, right? So like, you know, um Gnosis chain something, you know, Gnosis chain bridge or something like that, right? Um but then there's a category to which I guess is what you're getting at. So you have a category description. So this is like a staking contract, it's a bridge, it's a dex, it's a it's a DeFi pool, it's a yield farm. Like there's sort of a taxonomy of different things it could be. And the idea is it, um, what we're aiming to do is both. Give it a name, a specific name, and also give it a category. Uh, and and in fact, like the category also, it doesn't always neatly fall into one category. So you might want to give it like multiple different labels, from, like multiple different indicators, right? So this is both a staking contract and it's a token. Like think of staked ETH with Lido, for example. That's kind of it doesn't neatly fall into one category. Um, so the idea is to do both, like give it a name and give it a category. So I've not tried this yet. So um, if um, if you were to kind of put a newly deployed um, smart contract or any smart contract into uh, into uh, ChatGPT or any of its competitors, will it be able to tell you what what it does? No. Um, if if it were that easy, then we would have just done that. Uh, we have we have tried, no. But you have to, um, you you know, don't want to. I guess like give away too much of the secret sauce. But but you have to sort of you do have to use ChatGPT. It's a good idea to use ChatGPT, but you have to sort of guide it with the right prompts and make it use the right sources for it. Okay, so kind of you you want you want ChatGPT to kind of figure out what's the business logic behind this smart contract. Yeah, kind of. And you have to sort of chain it, like do multiple steps, right? So it's like, yeah, again, I don't, I don't want to give away too much, but but the idea is like roughly you want to try to make it understand, you want it to make sure, you want to make sure that it has all the information, A, and then B, that it can synthesize all of the information and then, you know, put it into like a meaningful category or give it a meaningful name. And then, you know, so you can, you can think of this as like, um, you have LLMs and then, you know, you could fine tune LLMs, but it's actually in practice, you end up making better use of the context than you do to fine tune the LLM. And then you also do it iteratively. So you kind of ask it to solve multiple different problems iteratively or like in a sequence. And then at the end, you kind of get something that is useful, but it's more, so it's, a, you could, you know, the very sort of short form way of putting it. It's like a, it's a form of prompt engineering, but it's it's actually like pretty involved prompt engineering. Yeah, I can imagine. Sorry, just one more thing on that, right? Because it's not enough, like ChatGPT doesn't have our existing 300 million address labels, right? And so that's where you get kind of an edge too, because our own version of this can also tap into the existing labels we have. And because of that compounding effect I said earlier, where like if you know the neighbors, it can help you figure out what the label of this one is. You get this kind of sort of a moat that's built around kind of being able to label stuff with high precision and very fast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you guys also use AI on the other side. So kind of if I, I'm a user and I search for stuff, um, you, you have smart search and um, similar similar things. How, how, do, how does What does it allow me to do and how does it work? Yeah, so maybe on this end, probably the best example is Signals, which is a feed and almost looks like a Twitter feed or something. And you have sort of these cards and each card is a signal that we've observed on chain. And so this could be, um, you know, uh, Pepe token has, you know, this amount of million dollars going into centralized exchanges. That's 20 times more than an average day. Like that's an example of a signal. And these signals are personalized based on, you know, what you have done in our platform. So um, if you have saved certain tokens to your watch list, if you have maybe added certain addresses to your watch list, 
or NFTs. And then soon, this is something we're rolling out uh, in the next few months, uh, we're bringing together our portfolio tracker with the analytics product. So if you have your portfolio tracked with us, we can personalize the signals that you see in your feed based on your 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 own portfolio and your history, the history of trading and so on and so forth. So um, it's actually a toggle in the product where you can switch on and off personalization. So either you could just get the kind of vanilla feed that everyone gets, or you can get a personalized feed based on you know what you have indicated to us that you're interested in through your behavior in the platform, what you search for, what you've saved, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of this isn't new, right? This is just you know what Amazon has been doing since almost the 90s or at least early 2000s in like people who are interested in this are also interested in that, like recommender systems. So this part isn't necessarily that new. But interestingly, you haven't seen a lot of personalization in Web3 yet, which is something that's a little bit puzzling. I think it's maybe because, firstly, it's a very young space. But secondly, we didn't have like enough data that it was needed. People could still just go on CoinGecko and like find the coin. But I think we've we've entered the era now where you have literally millions of assets. And so it's no longer feasible to just search for the asset you care about. You actually need to get stuff recommended to you because the inventory has become so large that it's not you can't just look through it in a catalog or like on a ranking. And so that's why I think now personalization is probably going to play a bigger role in crypto and that's what we're trying to lead into and obviously you make use of machine learning and ai to m- make that happen at scale so, so that actually puts you in a super powerful position because not only do you have um really well organized repertory of all the data that's on chain you also have kind of like the private user data that they share with you do you is there kind of some sort of ethics codex of kind of like how you treat the user data that's kind of shared with you? Do you kind of, do you monetize that? Do you kind of use that to kind of cross-reference things behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, there are, yeah, it's a great question, right? Uh, naturally, you have to, first of all, respect just general privacy regulations, right? GDPR and so on and so forth. And so... So and that you know has its own sort of set of rules and, and things to to make sure that you're not violating right and that there's consent and so on and so forth. Secondly, you know we have a Chinese wall. This is because this is a concern I think that many people have and it's a valid concern. It's like if I use nonsense, are you going to use what I search for to label like my addresses, for example? If I search for my own address, you're going to use that. And the answer is no, because there's literally a Chinese wall between the department that has access to any user data and the department that has access to labeling wallets. And it's kind of hard for us to prove this because we're not like an open source uh, company, obviously, or a project. Um, but that that's the reality. And so that's in our privacy policy and it's also how the company is structured and literally people don't have access to both of those two things at once we don't monetize that data i don't think it i don't think we 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 don't need to like we don't have an ads based business model like our business model is very straightforward you just pay for the subscription and you know you get access to the product so in a way i kind of like that business model because it's the most transparent it's very business honest. model you, yeah. yeah, it's very honest. Pe- many people don't like it because they're so used to getting stuff for free, but on the back end, their data You're is being sold to... Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so in a way, I feel like we're like the, 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 the dumb, honest people. Like we're just charging you to use the product and like that's it. We don't need to have some like nefarious way to exploit your data on the back end. You could give people the choice. You could say, do you, do you, do you, do you want to be private and uh, y- y- you, you pay? Or do you do you want us to kind of monetize your data in some other way and you get to use it for free? Yeah, maybe maybe that's an idea. Yeah. I mean I, I, I will like on the topic of business models, right? I think I sort of think of ads as the the default business model of web two. And I think that the default business model of web three is gonna be transactional. So you know, it's not unlikely that our subscription model at some point will get displaced by a more transactional business model. So does that mean maybe you have CowSwap integrated into Nonsen and when you find tokens in token god mode, 
you click buy and you execute the trade through CalSwap and maybe CalSwap and Nonsen share any fees that are involved in that, right? So, you know, that to me seems like a more future-proof business model. Um, I'm not super excited about the ads business model, but yeah, that's a, that's a big kind of strategic topic on its own. Kind of thinking forward, um, h- how do you see the rise of privacy? I mean, kind of a lot of your business model kind of hinges on the fact that things on chain are inherently transparent, right? So with the rise of privacy preserving technologies on chain, um, how do you think that's going to change? Yeah, I mean, um, I think of this as you can't have both. Uh, at the same time uh, to the maximum extent. And so it becomes a trade-off as with many things in technology. You can't have full tri- privacy and you can't have full transparency at the same time. And so, um, you know, our product makes the most sense, obviously, when there's room to have transparency. And so I think the reality is that many people value the transparency of blockchains because it gives them a sense of comfort that if you know that hey, the funds that are sitting in Aave, I can actually like see all of the transactions that have ever happened with Aave, and I can see all the funds sitting in the smart contract, and so on and so forth. That gives people a sense of comfort. They might not actually do it, but the fact that they know they can do it may- gives them sort of more trust. And if you contrast that to, say, a bank or an FTX, then you kind of quickly realize that the lack of transparency can become an issue. So I think our product naturally works best when you have chains that are public and transparent. It seems obvious to me as like a consumer that blockchains in their current form don't really work really well for payments, for example, and things you might want to do in your daily life. Uh, where you do want to have more privacy. And I think it makes sense that you'll probably get some uh, some world where either protocols or even chains or L2s, you know, have full privacy, but maybe there are some guardrails or like some rules around it. So I'm not saying I, this is what I want, but I think like one way one way you might imagine this is what if you had an L2 that basically had privacy um, somehow, but you could not make transactions over some certain amount, you know, size, right? Again, I'm not saying this is necessarily the world I want, but I could see that being something that regulators might be more comfortable with than one where there's like no limit and, you know, Lazarus from North Korea can, you know... uh, uh, potentially transact hundreds of millions of dollars in in volumes. So, I think I think you can look at look at it from sort of an ethical slash moral perspective, and then you can also look at it just from a sort of a pragmatic perspective of like what what are regulators going to almost allow, and and then finally you can look at it just from a trade off perspective. Like if you if you interact with something that has full privacy, what are you giving up in terms of transparency? And then there's like interesting solutions around zero knowledge proofs and so on, which in some cases can give you sort of the trust you want and like some form of transparency without revealing everything that's going on. But I think it's a a really interesting space. I don't think you will ever get to a point where everything you do on chain is totally private. And I think that also defies the... the um, the object to a certain extent, right? So, I mean, w- yes. what what ideally you you kind of want is kind of transparency for the man and uh, and kind of like privacy for the little guy, right? So, kind of you you yes. you want pa- yes. you want you totally. w- you want transparency to kind of hold power accountable, but you 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 don't. So you you want to know what your government spends its money on. You don't need to know what your neighbor spends and the, his and money on. And the crazy on. thing is, it's like the inverse in you know the world. In in many countries, it's the inverse, right? Where like governments can see everything you do in in practice. Like they could just reach out to a bank, get all your data or whatnot, or they could sort of have a you know um, 
some sort of back channel into your web two products, you know, whether that's Google or Twitter or whatever. Uh, but then, you know, there's really no transparency on like how they're like, where, where did all of that money that was spent on initiative X by the government go and so on and so forth. Yeah, totally. So I think you do want transparency for, uh, the people you elect for sure. Right. That's, in a way, it's kind of crazy that you don't have that in like every democracy, literally down to every transaction that they make with taxpayers' money, right? So, so exactly like that. You know, could there be like a nonsense for all government spending? Yeah, that'd be amazing. Like, I would ooh, love, love that. To that. Kind of, yeah, yeah I would absolutely love that. <laughs> um, so you you alluded to this in the very beginning. So um, you label well-known people on chain. Um, so. Obviously, there's ethical considerations kind of that come with it. So say I'm um, Doak one and I feel like uh, I don't, I mean, I, you have rightly labeled me, um, but I don't want this to be known on chain. Can I can I kind of send you an email and you will delete the, the label or what, what's your policy? Yeah, you can. I mean, that's the short answer as you can. Um, but there's always there's always been a nuance, right? And maybe it, it might be helpful just to explain like how you get there in the first place, like why someone, an individual, might get their name uh, on an address, right? And that's typically uh, because there's information in the public domain that we can point to. So, for example, someone says on a governance forum, "Hey, this is my address. I'm voting on, you know, Initiative X or uh, Proposal X." And they are basically declaring that they own this address, right? And and of course, there are caveats to that. Like someone could just be pretending to be them and so on and so forth. But if that is credible, we would label that. And then you could point to that in your evidence, right? If they then choose that, actually, I don't want that to be labeled. I want it to be deleted. Yeah, then we will do that. But at least that's the explanation of like how the information ended up uh, in our database in the first place, right? So it's not like we go around trying to sniff out, you know, normal people's sort of individual names you, and like label addresses with them. You don't look over them. people's shoulders when they kind of do transactions at ECC. No, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. And in fact, like, you know, you if we if we wanted to do stuff like that, I mean, maybe not that, that thing exact, but if we wanted to sort of, go on Twitter and hunt down every time someone like is a little bit silly in declaring something, for example, responding to tweets about post your address and you'll get an airdrop or, you know, here is my new NFT that I bought, which again, uniquely, you know, basically doxes your wallet. If you wanted to do that kind of stuff systematically, like we could, but we just don't think that's the right thing to do firstly. And secondly, I don't think it's like newsworthy in the sense like people, the, what we do can be seen as a form of journalism, right? So then you have to s kind of ask yourself like, okay, if Vitalik has a wallet that has like, you know, a billion dollars in it. Yeah, that's newsworthy. People should probably know about that. If the founder of a project, you know, has a lot of money in that token, that's newsworthy. People should know about that. If some person has a 200 bucks, you know, and bought some NFT on base and then they told someone about that on Twitter, we don't systematically track down that information and put it into our system. We could, in theory, because it's public information, but we don't really do it. Sure, absolutely. Um, so tell us about um, what, what's coming for Nansen. What, what kind of, so you already talked about um, the, the hot contracts uh, update that, uh, that is, but what else do you have in store? Yeah, so the hot contracts update is a kind of a smaller example of how the labels are just going to get a lot better because we are investing a lot in AI-driven attribution. Um, and that's going to happen, I think, faster than we initially anticipated, actually. Um, the second thing that I also mentioned is portfolio is going to get integrated into Nonsense 2. And this is actually kind of a big deal because it allows us to personalize the product even more. And I think... You know, the ambition there is to be the preferred portfolio tracker of any on-chain investor. And so we are very much on-chain oriented, right? So we believe that if you have the best coverage of chains and assets and protocols and 
we can give you signal on white, what you might be interested in investing in, that's a really potent com combination. And so bringing portfolio into non two, I think is gonna be a game changer, frankly, and it's gonna happen in the next few months. The third thing is we are integrating lots of new chains. The one chain that we have been asked about the most is Solana. And so we're gonna launch that um, hopefully within two months. Um, and I think that's gonna be pretty big and we have some some exciting ideas to try out with Solana because it's kind of a its own little ecosystem and pocket. So we're gonna try out some more experimental ideas with Solana. Um, and in addition to that, I think you know we're gonna strengthen some of the things that we're already known for, like smart money tracking is getting better. We have a now we have a new squad internally that's just focused on taking that to the next level. So things like really good PL tracking of traders, finding wallets that you might want to monitor because they're really good at trading. Um, that's something that we're leveling up and improving, making the overall product easier to use because it can be a bit overwhelming for people, but it's, I think, constantly getting simpler to use in a way. Like we're trying to strip away stuff, like eliminating stuff that's not absolutely necessary in the user experience. Um, so those are some of the things, but I, I think like, you know, overall, we've put Nansen 1 behind us. In fact, we're switching off Nansen 1 literally t tomorrow. So we've kind of firmly made the transition to Nansen 2. And that means we can sort of put the, we can travel lightly. We can put behind us a lot of the tech debt that we had from the first version of the product. And then we can really just focus on the, the innovations for the new version of the product. So yeah, this actually literally in the next three months, there's a lot to look forward to if you're an Nansen user. Wonderful. Um, so where can we send listeners to kind of check out Nansen? Yeah, you can go to nansen.ai. That's uh, the best place to start. And you can also follow Nansen underscore AI on Twitter. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.